Hi guys, Dane here and welcome to my July 2020 reading wrap up. So I only have the one book to talk to you about today and that is Isaac Asimov's Extraterrestrial. So this is edited by Isaac Asimov, uh, Martin Greenberg and Charles Woe. And uh, it brings together a bunch of different authors so I should probably read you the listing as we have the introduction by Isaac Asimov, Doorstep by Keith Lama, In the Jaws of Danger by Piers Anthony, The Witness by Eric Frank Russell, The Mississippi Saucer by Frank Belknap Long, Primary Education of the Cameroy by R.A. Lafferty, Tween by J.F. Bone, Zoo by Edward D. Hock, Subcommittee by Zena Henderson, Keyhole by Murray Leinster, and Kindergarten, and Kindergarten by James E. Gunn. So what's quite cool is each of them has like a couple of lines right at the start as well where Asimov introduces them and talks about a couple of the concepts. Uh, I don't think, well it's not really an Asimov book, you know, the writing is up to scratch though, like it was as enjoyable as an Asimov book. And it does a lot of the similar things where it kind of covers these bigger questions. It's obviously sci-fi. Uh, and these are actually all grouped together by the theme of extraterrestrials. But for example, one of them looks at how aliens are taught in school. And I just love this stuff. I think there's, there was this quote, and I can't remember where I saw it, but um, the quote was that the job of the science fiction author isn't to predict cars, it's to predict the traffic jam. And um, I think this, again, these kind of stories where it looks at what schooling would look like for aliens, they're just so cool because, um, you know, they investigate a lot of issues that are you know quite important for us to think about so yeah overall i did enjoy it i would give this probably a 3.75 out of 5 it's not quite as good as a regular isaac asimov book is it biggie but um it is still very much nuzzleable and um good to sit on as well so uh yeah after careful consideration with my boss here we decided to give it a 3.75 all right guys just the one book to wrap up for you today and that is third girl by agatha christie this is probably a pretty standard 3.5 out of 5 one of her later installments, a Poirot novel. It's got some weird stuff in it about drugs as well. Um, I wonder what the copyright year, I would say 60s, 70s? 1976, yeah. Uh, so she's talking about like heroin and stuff, which is quite, I guess, unusual for Agatha Christie. Uh, it was all right. Um, towards the end, especially with the solution, I felt as though I'd read it before, which isn't good um, because I haven't read it before. So it's just that the solution has been used before, um, like with different characters and stuff, but basically the same idea. So that was kind of a shame. Um, but yeah, I do like, I like reading to see how Christy kind of coped with society changing around her. I mean, it does kind of annoy me at times because she's got characters like, she was, she was like one of the characters was complaining, oh, well, that young man has long hair, these darned beatniks, they're everywhere these days. One simply can't tell whether somebody's a girl or a boy. And I'm like, well, first of all, gender is like isn't a binary thing <laughs> so so girl you know anyway and also why does it matter why does it matter to you whether some hippie who walked past you was a girl or a boy it doesn't so yeah but obviously it's a product of its times so 3.5 out of 5 it was all right it wasn't christie's best but um i'm glad i ticked it off seeing as i am a completionist and uh, yeah, I've got loads more Chrissy to get to soon. I've got like 12 or something, so soon. Just got a couple of books to wrap up for you today. Uh, the first one, actually, I'm just going to mention. I reread the audiobook of The Shawshank Redemption, which is part one of Different Seasons. I uh, did really enjoy it, actually. The reason I reread it is because I just watched The Green Mile on Netflix, and I was like, if this is The Green Mile, what the hell happened in Shawshank Redemption? Apparently, I get those two stories very confused. And in fact, they could literally have been combined into one story, like the ending of Shawshank could have been what happened at the end of The Green Mile, I suppose. But yeah, it was good. I gave it like a four out of five. It was pretty solid. I do think I prefer The Green Mile, but um, both of them are good. And, and King does actually a really good job of um, writing about jail prisoners and stuff as well. He kind of gets that sense of, um, you know, being trapped and being stuck in a small, small room, I suppose. Don't break this. This is an expensive book. This is a facsimile edition, Biggie. Then I read The Diamond As Big As The Ritz, uh, The Stories of F. Scott Fitzgerald, Volume 1. Um, I gave this one a pretty solid 4 out of 5, but I thought it was very good. Um, Fitzgerald's writing, as always, you know, I've always really enjoyed it. So, um, yeah, I was, I was glad to sort of sink this one, I suppose. Um, there are only seven stories in this. I'll give you which stories. Um, so we start with the cut glass bowl. Sort of very flapperish looks at society. The idea being there's a cut glass era now, and it's because you get all these cut glass presents for your wedding and stuff. Uh, then we have May Day, which was 
probably the weakest story, which is a shame because it's also the longest. Then we have the diamond as big as the Ritz, which was just a stunning. There's literally a diamond as big as the Ritz in it. Basically, this family knows where a mountain is that's literally a mile wide diamond. So they've kind of been slowly but surely getting little, little bits of diamond from it. But they have to stop because they don't want to flood the market and make the cost of the value of diamonds crash. Um, and, um, you know, all the money that they've accumulated would be worthless, basically, if this came out. So they have to keep it as a secret. Then we have the rich boy. Um, that's dealing very much, again, with sort of the class and um, what it means to be wealthy. Crazy Sunday. Don't particularly remember that one. An alcoholic case. Don't remember that one particularly well either. And the Lees of Happiness, which was quite good. Um, it's actually not the normal kind of story that I would enjoy, but I thought it worked pretty well here. It was quite romancy and relationship based. So all in all, pretty good. Okay, I have got two books to update you on. So the first one of these is The White Company by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This has been my bedtime book for over a month now, so I'm glad I finally got to it. It's got this tiny, tiny print. And like constantly throughout, it's like, buy my troth, buy my hilt. Like, uh, literally, let's have a look. Let's find some um, a page with some dialogue. It might actually be hard, because quite a lot of it. Okay, buy my soul. I would rather have a dry death, quoth Sir Oliver. Though more dear, I've eaten so many fish that it would but justice that the fish should eat me. But you get people who literally do like, buy my troth, buy my hilt, like in back-to-back -back sentences. Oh, ma foi, that's another one. To the point at which it does your head in when you're reading the dialogue. Um, I mean, it's historical fiction. It's interesting enough, uh, well researched and whatnot. Um, it's, it's quite interesting that it's historical fiction written in what is now a historical time. You know, and obviously Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is the uh, creator of Sherlock Holmes. It's one of the authors I'm trying to slowly get through everything, and um, so yeah, I'm glad I ticked this off. But I couldn't give this anything higher really than a 2.75 out of five because it's just it's tough work. You know, um, yeah, I'm glad I soldiered through it soldier being the key word here because it is about a bunch of like well i guess in game of thrones terms of cell swords but it's just super dense and um only really of interest to the specialist reader i would say but not necessarily badly done it's just you know 130 year old historical fiction so it's tough you know i did enjoy a lot of the frenchy stuff though and then next up, I read The Mysterious Affair at Styles by Agatha Christie. So this is her first ever novel, and it's also the first ever uh, um, Hercule Poirot novel. This is the facsimile edition by Harper Collins as well. I was actually given this by my uncle, which is very cool. And um, we have this little blurb here, which I assume was the blurb at the time. It says, This novel was originally written as the result of a bet that the author, who had previously never written a book, could not compose a detective novel in which the reader would not be able to spot the murderer though having access to the same clues as the detective. The author has certainly won her bet, and in, and in addition to a most ingenious plot of the best detective type, she has introduced a new type of detective in the shape of a Belgian. This novel has had the unique distinction for a first book of being accepted by the Times as a serial for its weekly edition, and I can imagine this would work well serialised. It's actually just a really well-written and well-executed um, novel, you know? I would say if you've never read Christie before, it's not a bad place to start, and for me, it was interesting because I've read so much Christie and yet somehow never got to this. It was interesting to see those like early depictions of Poirot and the early uh, descriptions of him. So uh, yeah, overall really did enjoy this one, probably a 4.25, maybe even a 4 out of 5. I have two books to update for you today. Uh, the first one is called Where Do We Go From Here by Isaac Asimov. The one I had was actually part two. So it was originally published as a hardback, uh, and so my version is part two because for the paperback they split it into two. From what I understand, they actually did it purely to make more money out of it, which I find kind of funny. But uh, yeah, uh, it was all right. Um, I, there was a, an Asimov story in it, which was quite good. There was an Arthur C. Clarke short story in it that was quite good. Um, and there was one, and I think it was called Omnilingual. Was it Omnilingual? Uh, yes, the short story is called Omnilingual by H. Beam Piper. Um, and basically they find, uh, scientists find like some evidence of life on Mars, including some writing. And so they're trying to translate the Martian writing and they're explaining they need like something bilingual that has it in both Martian and some other language that they understand to translate it. And ultimately, I'm going to spoil it very slightly here, but you should read this short story. It's great. Um, the thing that they find that does that is the periodic table because the periodic table is the same anywhere. Whereas I don't know, like the concept of art 
how do we know that Martians have the concept of art? We don't. So there's all of this stuff with our form of communication. Uh, no matter what language we use, any human language is inherently human, you know? Whereas the periodic table is based upon the number of, I think it's the number of protons orbiting the electron. I don't know. I, I'm going to show my ignorance of what exactly, how exactly the uh, periodic table is ranked. By numbers, isn't it? By atomic weight. So the atomic weight of hydrogen is always one or whatever it is. Hey Google, what's the atomic weight of hydrogen? 1.01. That's what I said. That's what I said, wasn't it, Biggie? We know how heavy hydrogen is. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We we love hydrogen in this house, don't we, Biggie? Oh, hydrogen is our favourite. So yeah, overall, uh, Arthur C. Clarke's short story was just okay. Asimov's story, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, the other stories, some were good, some were bad, but this one, this Omnilingual by H. H. Beam Piper, that alone made the whole thing worth reading, you know? Uh, I would give this collection like a 3.25 out of 5. Um, it's not necessarily immediately worth getting to. Um, I'm just trying to tick off everything that Asimov did, and really, I don't even know if I'm going to keep doing the things that he edited, because he himself said that he wasn't a very good editor, so, you know. And then I read The Secret of Chimneys by Agatha Christie. So this is the HarperCollins uh, facsimile edition. Very beautiful. My uncle gave me these. So thank you, Uncle Carl. Uh, this is the first Inspector Battle novel. So it's neither Poirot or Marple. Battle as a character is actually all right. I don't particularly like or dislike him. Um, but obviously, if you've not got Marple or Poirot, it's usually a little bit of a letdown with Christie. This one was almost more, um, you know, international espionage and like mili not quite military, but like, you know, di diplomatic thrillery. Um, there are elements of cozy mystery in there as well, but it's definitely not like full true cozy mystery. That made it interesting to read. I did think it was about 50 pages too long, though. Um, but I like the intrigue and the way that Christy, she does this quite a lot where uh, the interfamilial relationships, sorry, I thought you were going to bite me, Biggie, where the interfamilial relationships come into play. Um, and like, you know, it, it becomes important that the Duchess, the Dowager of Kent, used to know Ariadne Oliver and Ariadne Oliver's cleaner now works for so and so. Oh, you know what I mean? All these little things come into play, which I think is very cool. But again, overall, I actually gave this one, uh, I gave this one a 3.25 out of 5 because it was just, uh, you know, it was just what it was. Um, but I'm glad I ticked it off. That's one more Agatha Christie that I've done. All right, I've got a few books to wrap up today. Um, so we might do these bit by bit. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we have The Crack Up with Other Pieces and Stories by F. Scott Fitzgerald. And uh, this is like part number two of the stories of F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, the Penguin Edition. What's cool is this has fiction and non-fiction as well. Um, so it says here, for example, autobiographical pieces. We've got Echoes of the Jazz Age, My Lost City, Ring the Crack Up, Early Success. Then for the stories, we have Gretchen's Forty Winks, The Last of the Bells, Babylon Revisited, which I'd already read, Pat Hobby himself, and Financing Finnegan. Overall, I do think I enjoyed The Diamond as Big as the Ritz and other stories, which was the first kind of half of this, a lot more. Um, but it was, it, you know, I like him in different ways. So this one I enjoyed because of the non-fiction stuff. He actually wrote about the diamond as big as the Ritz and was talking about some of his early publication history and stuff. So I just thought that was fascinating from a writing perspective. But obviously it's arguably less entertaining than reading a short story, for example. And there are fewer short stories in this. Um, but yeah, I do enjoy it. I've enjoyed everything that I've read from uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, really. I'd probably still give this like a 3.75, maybe even a 4 out of 5. And then I read um, Losing My Virginity, the autobiography by Richard Branson. Now, I've had this copy for about five years and I actually read the prologue and thought it was really good and then just never continued with it for whatever reason. So it's been good to finally get back to it. I picked this up while traveling because I always hit the longest unread book that I own. This is about uh, 520 odd pages, but the, the print is decent size, pretty big. So, um, you know, I can live with that. And uh, actually, it was really interesting. I mean, I'm not a particularly big, like, Richard Branson fan or anything, but um, he has had, like, an interesting life, and so it was cool to read about it, especially some of his adventures. The only thing I would say is that towards the end, the last 150 pages or so is just him raging about um, BA. And uh, I don't know, I just didn't care that much, to be honest. So, and so it could have been shorter and still been you know, is impactful, if not more impactful. But overall, I gave it like a four out of five. I would say if you're interested in business and you see yourself as an entrepreneur or want to be an entrepreneur, this is probably going to be a good one for you to read. So uh, check it out.
Yeah, four out of five. Okay guys, just the one book to update you on, and that is The Murder at the Vicarage by Agatha Christie. This is the, this is the first of the Miss Marple books, and uh, Miss Marple is like one of my favourite Christie characters. So uh, you know already that I'm going to enjoy this, you know? So yeah, it was just really cool to go back to the start and to see where uh, Miss Marple got her start, to see the way she was introduced. There's some really interesting characterization in this that I picked up on. So I will be doing a full review of this soon, but suffice to say that I did enjoy it and I gave it a pretty solid 4 out of 5, maybe even a 4.25 out of 5. And uh, because it's the first Marple book, if you're new to Christie, it's actually not a particularly bad place to start. So um, yeah, definitely worth considering at the very least. Hi guys, Dane here, and just the one book to update you on today, and that is Coriolanus by William Shakespeare. Okay, it's this way around. It's sometimes hard to it's sometimes hard to tell with this um, because the print on the back, if you look at it, it's upside down. Isn't it, Biggie? Are you going to let me film this at all? Are you going to let me do any of this? So um, Coriolanus or the tragedy of Coriolanus, it's a shame he's in the way because this is a really beautiful edition that I, I can't show to you. But um, yeah, it's the tragedy of Coriolanus. It is um, a, a tragedy uh, with a very sad ending, uh, as tragedies are wont to have. It's kind of written hand in hand with uh, Antony and Cleopatra in that they're both tragedies from around about the same part of Shakespeare's career and um, they both um, deal with like Roman generals and stuff, and Rome. But uh, yeah, historical fiction in a play, man. And not even that, I mean, I guess historical non-fiction because it is based on a true story. Beautifully written, real pleasure to read it in this stunning edition with all of like, even just the layout is beautiful and really easy to read. Um, it's got a lot of illustrations which break it up as well. Helpful glossary at the end. I'm trying to find an illustration. Here's one. So overall, I gave this a 4 out of 5 and did enjoy. And I'm looking forward to reading some more Shakespeare. I know, Biggie. Thank you for your help. Yo, hey, the cool thing about this camera is that it just perches on top of the tripod. I don't need to screw it in. Oh, hello. It's pinging. It's pingy pooing. Right, I have three books to wrap up for you. These are all Ladybird books for adults by J.A. Hazley and J.P. Morris. We have the Ladybird book of dating, we have the Ladybird book of the meeting, and the Ladybird book of the dog. So I don't have dogs, but I know of dogs, and so I enjoyed this. Uh, I have been in meetings, so I enjoyed this. And I have dated, so I enjoyed this. I gave all of these four out of five. I think the best way for me to convey what they're all about is literally just to read you bits from them. So that's what I'm going to do. So we're skipping at random, a page at random for each one. Actually, I did quite like that one. Let's go back to that one. Men's brains and women's brains are different, even as children. Boys like to knock a hula hoop off an after eight with a cocktail stick. Girls prefer balancing a first class stamp on top of a Mr. Man's bowler hat. To get along, men and women pretend not to mind those little differences, or they become homosexuals. Yep, pretty much accurate, I would say. The Ladybird Book of the Meeting, we have got this. Roland and Dan are having an informal chat before going into their pre-meeting about the meeting to discuss the pre-conference plans for this year's conference. Roland has had a toothache for six months, but has not had the time to meet the dentist. And here we have How It Works, the dog. Dog and man have been friends for many thousands of years. Dognald is going to bury his owner's dinner in the garden, in case any hyenas or jackals or saber-toothed tigers come and try to steal it. Thank you, Dognall. That is very useful of you. All right, just the one book to update you guys on today, and that is They Came to Baghdad by Agatha Christie. This is like one of her non-series novels, I guess, but I really enjoyed it because I think Christie's great at writing about foreign places. Uh, so Death in the Nile is another one of my favourites, and obviously that's set in Egypt. This one's been taking place in Iraq. Uh, it was published in about 1950, and the thing that makes this one really quite unique is that the protagonist is just this young woman. Now, admittedly, she does go to Iraq because she's basically following this handsome guy that she fancies. Um, so that's not the best, but she's this really quite strong female character. She just sort of blags away there, and um, when she just when she decides she's going to do something, she does it. So she kind of ends up getting involved in this like international espionage kind of style plot, which admittedly isn't where Christie's at her best. Um, but it was enjoyable and enjoyable enough read. I gave it a pretty solid 4.25 out of 5 and would recommend it. And it's not a bad little standalone as well. Especially, as I say, if you're more into like international espionage stuff, it's probably better than like going into one of Christie's cozy mysteries. And as you can see, I've tabbed it out, so a full review will be coming soon. 
Hello everybody, just the one book to wrap up for you today and that is Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. So this was a bedtime book for me. I previously read Treasure Island, honestly didn't really enjoy that much. Didn't really enjoy this that much either. The character of David Balfour uh, I think was a better protagonist but there were just I don't know, a lot of parts to this I didn't enjoy. It's very much one of those novels where it's the story is told in chapters. Uh, one of those novels. Um, but where the chapters themselves are kind of like standalone short stories as well. So the adventures that David gets up to, some of them are more interesting than others, I would say. Uh, and by the end of this, I was just gagging to finish it, to be honest. Uh, having said that, I am glad I read it. I would give this like a 2.75 out of 5, almost, but not quite a 3. Uh, I probably wouldn't recommend it, even if you're into classics, to be honest. I don't know, it's the same with Treasure Island. I just didn't enjoy it much. I would I would personally uh, like recommend um, Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe ahead of, ahead of either or both of these. Hello! I have a book to wrap up for you guys. So I finished reading The Death of Expertise by Tom Nichols, the campaign against established knowledge and why it matters. I've actually already posted a full review of this, so I guess I will link to that uh, below. Uh, it's a non-fiction book, and it is about the death of expertise. It's about basically how everybody today thinks they're an expert. And actually, um, there's something called, oh, what's the law called? Uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect. And basically, this is where the more incompetent people are, the better they think they are. So there's like a, a, a thing where you start learning a new skill and you go up and up and up and you get to about this point where you've just started and you're like, oh, this is easy because uh, you don't know how much you don't know. Then you kind of level out. Then you drop steeply back down because you're like, oh my God, this is much deeper than I thought it was, right? And then you start to go back up again and you never actually hit that first level of confidence, really, because you're super overconfident here. You get down to here and you've got much more subject matter knowledge, but you're not as confident as you first were because you know, holy shit, this is complicated, basically. So, <laughs> so a great example in this was that um, Americans were more likely to support um, bombing the Ukraine if they didn't know anything about it. So um, basically it showed that Americans who thought the Ukraine was in either Australia or South America were much more likely to support bombing it than if they thought it was where it is in Europe near Russia, which is crazy. There was also a poll that went out asking Republicans and Democrats whether they uh, supported bombing Agrabah and uh, you, they could either be uh, in favour, neutral or not in favour. And uh, basically it found that, yeah, the, the Republicans were more likely to, to support bombing. The uh, Democrats were more likely to have a, a stand overall. But Agrabah is where Aladdin is set as well. So it was something like 68% of Democrats have a position on whether we should bomb the place where Aladdin is set. So, um, yeah, there was some interesting stuff in this. Overall, I gave it like a four out of five. It did flag towards the second half, but uh, I am glad I read it. And I think it gives some really interesting insights in today's society, uh, especially in a coronavirus era. I mean, this is actually being updated to reflect uh, the Trump administration. And it's kind of interesting reading it now when it kind of needs updating again for COVID, you know? But yeah, interesting. Guten Tag, yes. Well, Guten Morgen. Um, I have some books to update you on. So I read Louise Candlish, The Other Passenger. It's actually a signed copy I got. Uh, this came with the uh, book box that I did an unboxing of um, earlier this month. And it's a thriller, it's a fairly generic thriller to be honest. It, uh, the, the theme for the box was um, books that take place on public transportation. And so this takes place on um, the ferries that, you know, go take people to work in London basically. Uh, it's very much in the in the vein of Gone Girl and uh, Girl on the Train and all of that, all of that stuff. Um, not to say there's anything wrong with it, I mean I would say it's not, um, there's nothing like amazing that's um, like groundbreaking or anything in it but it does hit a lot of those um, buzzwords that people look out for and it does a pretty competent job of telling the story as well. Um, lots of twists and turns, some of them I did guess, some of them I didn't guess. Fairly unlikable characters, unreliable narrator, all of that stuff. Basically, yeah, if you like contemporary thrillers, uh, you'll probably enjoy this. Uh, I, I would say it's one of the better ones. I mean, I enjoyed this more than Gone Girl, for example. Um, so, yeah, four out of five. Oh, shit me, cat. I thought you were going to attack me, but you weren't. You just, I just haven't slept, so I'm very nervy and on edge. 
Um, I also want to mention here, They Came to Baghdad by Agatha Christie. If you're shaking, it's because Biggie's nuzzling the tripod. Um, they Came to Baghdad by Agatha Christie. So um, this is a standalone novel of hers, I believe. I read it earlier this month. Basically, I did rather enjoy it. Um, I'm a fan of um, Christie when she's writing about foreign places. So that's kind of why one of my other favourites of hers is Death on the Nile. Biggie, what are you doing? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, it was interesting to read her take on Baghdad, and it was cool because there were like um, old place names in it, like Heathrow Aerodrome, with Heathrow spelled as two words and stuff, um, which is, uh, you know, very different to what it, what we know it as these days, as Heathrow Airport, or one word. Isn't it, Biggie? You're very distracting when I'm trying to do these reviews. And then, I read The Merry Wife... The Le and then I read The Merry Wives of Windsor by um, William Shakespeare. So this is my beautiful little Folio Society edition. Uh, this is one of Shakespeare's comedies. And it was very comedic, very light-hearted, very easy to get through. A lot of the wordplay still holds up today. There was a French doctor character in it who um, quite amused me as well. Um, Biggie, you've got knots all over your fluff you have. <laughs> Ow! Bit me elbow. Um, so yeah, a lot of the dialogue was really good in this one. Uh, it's quite easy to follow as well. I'd really like to see a performance of this too because I just think that the um, the delivery could all make a lot of these lines uh, pop a lot more as well. But yeah, I gave this one a pretty solid 4.25 out of 5 and it's left me wanting to read more Shakespeare. Hello, it is uh, the 1st of August. So that means that's your lot. So those are all the books that I read in the month of s July. <laughs> as always thanks a lot for watching don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so what you thought of them hit that subscribe button for more and i will see you soon for another bookish video thanks a lot Bye bye